everybody. I'd like to. Uh, yeah. I'm a walker. It doesn't work so well, but hope you can uh, hear me in the back. So I'm going to focus on some of the work we've been doing in our lab using CRISPR rather than giving you a comprehensive guide to our research. So our model system is Drosophila. We're interested in gene expression mechanisms, um, evolution, and using CRISPR is a great way to tackle some of these problems. So in considering genome engineering from the perspective of development of disease, if you think about gene regulatory networks as linked nodes and edges, here we just have a simplified example of the kind of gene regulation which we study in the Drosophila embryo, transcription factors turning on other transcription factors and regulating developmental genes. So some of the uh, objectives for genome engineering would ap apply just as Aaron has been discussing in making trans-regulatory genes. And what I mean by that is if one can knock out particular nodes, for instance, this is a repressor gene shown here in red snail. If we knock that out, we can simultaneously block then all the interactions with downstream genes and mess up mesoderm development, for example. And that's kind of the starting point for a lot of these studies. But many of the questions that really come into uh, disease-related research as well as evolutionary-related questions involves not trans changes, but cis, cis changes. So we're talking about DNA elements that are important for mediating these transcription factor effects. So for instance, instead of just knocking out the red gene here, if we simply remove some of the interaction sites on target genes, we can achieve a cis regulatory change down here where we remove certain interactions with snail and rhomboid. Uh, these more uh, delicate types of manipulations are going on all the time. Naturally, there are population variations in the human genome and the fly genome, which reflect these cis changes and are, in fact, important sources of variation in growth and development. So we want to be able to re-engineer genes to uh, not just take out entire coding regions, but also change the nature of the cis regulation. The approach that we've been using in our lab um, supported by VPGRS, in fact. Uh, we last summer then initiated our initial cis regulation changes by turning to some of the online tools that are available for primer design. And here I've just indicated a generic gene where we were selecting particular primers. Um, essentially, we order the primers from idtdna.com. They come in the mail. We have a um, standard annealing protocol where the novel specific guide RNA directing oligos are annealed um, in um, essentially a PCR reaction to make a double-stranded template, which then allows us to make specific guide RNA in vitro using T4, <coughs> or, uh, T7 RNA polymerase. Uh, Rewati was looking at me because she helped us troubleshoot these things, yes. In fact, when you include the promoter, you get much better production of RNA in vitro. Once these RNAs are produced in vitro then, Rewati uh, supervised an undergraduate who was starting in our laboratory last summer, Jared Ellenboss. Essentially, you take very early embryos, line them up on a microscope, and then with a very fine needle, inject those specific guide RNAs. And in this case, these embryos are from a line which are obtained from the stock center, which are expressing Cas9 specifically in the primordial germ cells. Although it's possible to do somatic um, crispering of animals, we're really interested in making germline alleles that we can then study in the context of other genetic backgrounds and play with those. So we're, we're trying to get the changes into the germline. The Drosophila embryo, conveniently enough, very early in development is a large syncytium, which means you can poke it at one end, squirt a little bit of your reagents, that is the specific guide RNAs, into the oocyte, and the Cas9 expressed in the primordial germ cells is supposed to essentially limit the CRISPRing to those germ cells which will eventually produce sperm or oocytes. And the next step then, these flies, the ones that survive, hopefully have CRISPRed gametes. They're crossed to other flies which contain marker chromosomes that are useful. And the next generation then hopefully you have a CRISPR event in a heterozygous state over a balancer chromosome, which we can track. 
And these animals then can be uh, crossed further to maintain that allele. So we want to get a chromosome that we've engineered and we need to be able to identify that initially then we were just using PCR, which can be rather tedious because it's not 100%. So in discussions in our group meeting then, we uh, came up with an idea that might um, simplify this process. And uh, Sanjay Pai and Column then made specific guide RNAs against a visible marker. Actually, Revati made the specific guide RNAs and Sanjay injected them. In this case, the, the visible marker is a gene called ebony, which has a visible cuticular color phenotype. And we can engineer that gene and do a knockout at the same time as we're targeting another gene. For instance, we've been working on insulin signaling in the fly, and it's important that we be able to manipulate the cis regulatory elements of the insulin uh, receptor gene. So these happen to lie on the third chromosome. Both of those specific guide RNAs were then injected at the same time. In an initial experiment, then Sanya found that there were a certain percentage of the offspring which showed this uh, trident kind of shape on the notum, which is uh, typical for an ebony mutation. So this provided a visible screening. And when you think about what's going on here, if it's going to work, your specific guide RNA is going to diffuse through the syncytium, end up in these nuclei, bind with Cas9, and do some editing. And if it's not going to work, maybe you didn't squirt it very well, or you didn't get enough material in there. Thanks. So probably you're either going to edit both genes, or you're going to edit neither one. And in fact, consistent with this idea is that all of the flies which had this marker, in this, in this particular experiment, 600 embryos were injected, 60 larvae, 30 survivors, six with this particular mark. All of these had this strong phenotypic effect, which we think is due to the targeting. In this case, Sandhya was targeting the Vang cell polarity gene. And uh, 24 other survivors that did not have ebony uh, did not show this developmental field phenotype, which suggests very strongly that we can use this just as an optical marker and save us an awful lot of PCR. We suggest this would be a very convenient way that other people working with insect systems we're going to be doing the same kind of injections maybe in our lab if you want to come over. Could similarly double target for uh, dispensable uh, um, marks like that. Uh, finally, one last point. CRISPR often gives you biallelic targeting. When you think about that, you've got two alleles for a particular gene that you're targeting in a cell. You might induce different size breaks, deletions, if you're just trying to knock out. It doesn't matter how much you've deleted. It's knocked out. In other cases, though, the uh, difference between those two alleles might be of interest, particularly if you're trying to get something in by homologous recombination. So I think about how this works in cells such as Aaron's description. You're just going to clonally prop propagate those cells. If you have two different alleles in the same cell, that may or may not be a problem, depending on what you're trying to achieve. In our case, where we're going germline, you're going to have to go through gametogenesis, which means that at one point, your meiotic product is, is haploid. So you've purified your allele. You've just got one of them. And that's really nice so that you can just have one of the alleles to study. And it's also a challenge in some cases because if you're messing around with genes that are important for this process, that is gametogenesis, you won't get any gametes if you mess them up too much. So genes that are expected not to be involved in germline cell development, go ahead and knock them out. Could come over with your specific guide RNAs and we'll just squirt them in. I don't think that those genes that you're working on are necessary for germline development. And if you're working on things like the insulin receptor, um, as we are, then it might be a problem depending on how severely you've modulated that. So there are various tricks to get around that, but one uh, final point that I would make from our initial experience is getting started is that there are quite a few tips online in papers and you actually have to do it in your own lab to discover some of the obvious but maybe not so obvious um, challenges that come up. So if you're working with invertebrates, if you're working with Drosophila or something else, maybe Suzuki, those agriculture people, um, just drop by and we'll be glad to chat about our experience. Thanks. Yeah, question.
assessing off-target dips in your system? Well, probably the, um, it's not really easy, but probably doing whole genome sequencing, which we do in flies, would be one possibility. But the other way to do it, which is probably easier, is it's rather easy to cross flies together and purify your hit a, into a new genetic background. And this is something that we're used to doing with chemical mutagenesis all the time. So you integress your gene into a clean background. Essentially, that's you know, probably. With mice, too, it takes a lot longer. Yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> so that's probably the quickest way. Okay, thank you.